So without further ado, we're going to get right into the discussion. I would like to bring up Miss Eva Westermark to the stage, talk a little bit about these in-between spaces that help us be. Eva, for you. <laughs> Turn this on. It's on. You can hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm super happy to be here. And good morning, everyone. Um, how do I do this? Yes, I do. Um, so we're going to talk about the future. And then I was like wondering, what am I doing here? Uh, all these AI and digital words. And I'm going to talk about the most like mundane, everyday spaces. But I thought maybe that's good that we can anchor the future in something that we all know something about. And that we're actually, when we're entering futures, will still have these spaces around us, all the physical places that surround us. They will change, we will change our behavior, but a lot of things will actually stay the same. So hopefully if you as I get a bit like anxious with all these possible futures, you can kind of come back and just think, okay, there's also something that is stable and kind of slow and do not change in this rapid, rapid change. Um, so urban well-being, a matter of place. Um, as an urban designer, oh, I do it wrong here, um, an architect, so I've spent like 25 years trying to understand the relationship between our physical environment and how that affects the way we behave in cities, how that affects how we feel in cities, and trying to figure out how can we design places that actually invite for social connections and not isolation. But also really acknowledging that it can be super hard to be a human being, like trying to make the right choices, trying to actually choose to walk or to cycle. Sometimes it's even like impossible to make that happen in some places. <clears throat> Because I think that the physical environment, as I see it, is really strong communication to us. It tells us who's invited and who's not. It really helps some people to feel belonging and some people not. And it doesn't really matter how we brand our places. It doesn't make it a very charming new city if we call it, just by calling it that. So just saying that some places, it's really hard to be well in some places. And if you at any time would find yourself driving a car to the gym and like taking the escalator up, going inside, simulating walking or cycling rather than doing that in your everyday, then I think you can just like give yourself a break and it's think that it's not all about your choices. It can actually be that you're in the wrong place. Because cities really changes not only our behavior, but it changes fundamentally our culture, the way we do things, the way we interact. And to give a very known example, Copenhagen, uh, maybe we have some Copenhageners here. Do we? Yes. Um, but you all know Copenhagen, today 63% uh, of Co Copenhageners bicycle uh, to and from work. And that's one of the highest numbers in the world. But of course it's not that Copenhageners are born with a cycling gene, right? Uh, this is something that the city is helping them to grow this culture. And I think it's so important when we go to Copenhagen to remind ourselves that the city that we take for granted is cycling, it's public life, it's walking. It hasn't always been like that. You know, Copenhagen has gone through this huge transformation over 50 years. Stroget was once filled with cars, like so many other cities. Stadet, the side street, the same. So Copenhagen has developed like 40 kilometers of bike lanes that today the culture is totally ingrained. 
So when we ask Copenhageners why they bicycle, like 5% say that's because of the environment, and over 60% say that it's just the most simple, quickest way to get around. Like it's not even a choice. So we really manage to create a city that helps people to be well without even thinking about it. And just, you know, cycling is maybe a very classic example. I think we can all understand how cities affect how we move in the city. But just think, what other things could we make happen? Like, could we have cities help us eat better? An example of a pilot project where we put this intervention between a school and the supermarket and had offering just these kids that went there several times a day to buy unhealthy food say, OK, maybe we can just offer them some healthy options. And also, in this case, offering planetary meals, so addressing some of Copenhagen's targets when it comes to uh, lowering CO2 emissions. Or thinking how we can use the physical spaces as tools to help us breathe better. Like, how can we help um, uh, protect us from air pollution? This is another pilot project we did. This is Örestad, maybe some of you recognize it. So here we found high, we didn't find, but uh, Google Airview found really high levels of pollution. And we measured that a lot of people are staying here and are exposed for a long time uh, for this air pollution. So we made this pilot this like really attractive place people could stay and be protected from air pollution at the same time also making it you know more attractive to wait for the bus. Um, and it got really popular, especially among some young people, local young people. Ironically enough, they used it to sit and smoke. But this is, I think, also the beauty of a pilot, like we could correct it and we can learn before we scale it up or roll it out. And uh, as a sort of opposite challenge as an urban designer working with city transformation is that how can we speed up that process? So it's not slowing down, you know, we have a digital evolution that is extremely fast. How can the physical environment try to at least meet it a little bit or meet how society are changing? So we're really the last you know, couple of years trying to find new methods of how do we do this? How do we transform cities in a different way? So one example I could give you is working in New York. So this was a project that started already in 2008. Um, and we were commissioned by DOT, Department of Transportation in, in New York. And really like nice American action-oriented focus, they told us that we know we see in Copenhagen, it's amazing. You know, it took 50 years for you to, for, for the city to transform the way people move. Can you do a similar thing, but in 500 days? A hard, little bit harder, but we can try, right? So just starting to look at the spaces is Times Square, Broadway. Um, maybe you remember that this was the case, but Super simple thing that we found that 90% of the users, they were pedestrians, but they were actually crowding on 10% of the space. But 90% of the space was used for cars, and that was actually just 10% of the users, so totally upside down. So how to change that? How to work with that as a like catalyst project? Um, the one thing that we did to try to overcome those classic barriers, we talked about this just earlier, so even in Tampara, in Finland, where are you here? Um, when you, any city we go to, uh, we're told, no, no, but we can't change this city because here, we're, this is in our blood, it's in our culture to drive. Don't change that. That's our culture, right? So the way to overcome this uh, part was doing a temporary intervention of the public spaces. So really closing off Broadway in pieces, closing off from traffic, painting on the ground, putting out uh, movable chairs and umbrellas, and having like a full scale e experiment. And people that were really, really skeptical, so they could, you could calm them down and say that, you know, within 48 hours, if something, if this is not working well, if people don't like it, we could actually turn it back. So that was a way to really overcome what we are all feeling, like an anxiety about change. How will that affect us? How will I feel? What will happen with my 
uh, my behavior. But we could then doing this in a fairly in city planning um, uh, ways, it was super quick. Yeah, usually it takes like 25, 30 years to change things. But this was done within a year, basically. Uh, and the actual physical transformation was really fast, like almost overnight, not really, but almost. Um, and then we could measure how people, how this transformation of the physical place actually uh, changed people's behavior. So just an example, we could see that there was a decrease of 40% of pedestrian injuries doing this. There was an increase of 84% more people staying in this place, so just not moving, but actually sitting down, interacting with other people and asking um, New Yorkers, so not the tourists, how they felt about this, 74% were really positive about the changes. So they, they, that was some of the keys or cues for politicians to dare to say, okay, maybe we dare to do this permanent. And then that sort of kick-started this transformation of, of places in New York. And because it was a process and not necessarily a project, of course it was a project, but it was really about the methodology of how to transform spaces, we could also help roll it out in the city. So through this program, uh, New York City Plaza program, now there's actually 70 new public spaces all over the city that has been transformed in a similar matter with a similar methodology, like really quick, transformation, testing it out, see how people use it, and also being able, because it's a test trial, to modify, to adopt to how people perceive it and how people actually use it. So then this is sort of a fast forward way to kickstart a transformation of behavioral change, uh, in this case, um, mobility. But I think also urban well-being, like it's far beyond infrastructure and, you know, making people act in certain ways is also about acknowledging that us as human beings, we're like social animals, we're emotional animals. And one of the big health crises today is loneliness. So, of course, our cities needs to help us come out more and meet other, play, uh, other people. And as an interesting Example, we have the BOA one area, most people know about it here in Malmö. Uh, and the master planner behind that uh, place, Klaus Tam, he talked about architecture, he called it manipulation. It was like, oh, manipulation? We don't want that, do we? But he's just saying that urban planners, designers, whoever is dealing with everything we share in our cities, we have to really know what we're doing because we are affecting people whatever we do, right? But then the question is, would we, do we want to be manipulated? Or do we accept being it? Well, I, I was like thinking that if it does help me to meet other people, like meeting my neighbors, I think I would, yeah, I think I would accept it. If it like would really make me be surprised and anchor me in the moment, uh, see the city in new ways, that seems like, yes, I would also say yes to that. Or just if you can like nudge me to play with other adults, even though I'm over 50, that's kind of cool as well. Or just the fact that city spaces could potentially just stimulate my senses to the degree that without going to a psychologist, I would maybe be more mindful. And maybe I would feel more connected to nature. So all of these things, I think, is beyond behavior. It's also how we feel about things and how we can use the city to help us being well in all the dimensions. And how we can connect the outer and the inner us. Um, I was super excited to hear two of my good friends, Philip and Viveka, uh, neuroscientists and psychologists that are starting this course in Lund called Psychology, uh, sorry, psychology and climate change. And they're doing this with this woman called uh, Christine Wendler. 
And apparently, I didn't know this, there's a lot of research saying things about what inner capabilities that we need as human beings to develop in order to be able to comprehend and to adapt to the sustainability, new, new needs that we need, the way we need to act, the way we need to be and change behavior. So things like we have to develop capabilities of feeling a sense of purpose or helping people to be empowered to be able to actually act or actually change. Um, raising the awareness of how we interact with, this, with the surroundings. All these things that are inner capabilities, we also have to address when thinking about how we build our cities. And then it becomes really complicated and really interesting because of course it's a matter of who, like we experience places so differently depending on who we are. Think if you're 95 centimeters tall, then you really, you're walking around the city experiencing it in a totally different way than how I would experience. So how can we like find out more about those emotional responses to places? Who feels welcome? Who feels that they belong where? And with what kind of prompts do we work with? So we've started to explore this much further now in some of the recent, recent projects. So right now, um, my colleagues in the US uh, are working with Stanford. And um, they are building, they are creating a new school. I don't know if you guys know about it but it's, uh, it's called the Stanford Durr School of Sustainability. And what they really want to do is, you know, accelerate the solutions to global uh, climate crisis. And they're working with some existing buildings within the campus, but also building some new uh, faculty buildings. And one thing as a foundation for this new school, they realize that there's no way they're going to solve these super complex pro uh, pro problems, uh, wicked problems that we're all facing, if they're only working with the usual suspects, like the students of the campus, the uh, Nobel Prize winners, uh, faculty uh, people. The core of the Stanford uh, community, of course, that's central, but they're never going to solve it. So how do we create a place within the Stanford community um, that also invites other people, where we can create a place where other people outside of this community um, feel that they belong. So we've helped them to create a vision that will further on guide the design of the spaces and the houses, but we wanted to then explore more in depth how different group of groups of people actually feel about these spaces at Stanford. So we use this new app that we have developed that we call the I Level City app. And it's basically a photo app and it helps us map this lived experience, we call it, like the emotional responses to different type of spaces. And super interesting to see what I think we all know, how different, different groups actually experience spaces and places. So just as a nice snapshot, we found that people of color, they had like their negative experience of different spaces were very much related to architecture, the way they self-reported and tagged all these images. Things like monumentality, even some modern architectural expressions was something that they felt, this makes me not feel that I belong or just how, how different places were named. And it was totally different from other groups. So it's very significantly linked to a certain group of people. And also if we're looking further that the L, I never said to say that, LGBTQ, uh, <clears throat> when we looked at that group, they were also saying that they didn't feel that they belong. They had this feeling of social exclusion if places were too, um, too manicured or too finely developed, like too exclusive, I think is the right word, which was different from other groups. And a lot of other interesting uh, findings from that study, but it, it sort of um, comes together 
Uh, and something that we have found in other projects, like this urban belonging project that um, we took place in Copenhagen, working with a group of representatives for underrepresented communities uh, and asking them, where do you belong and where do you not belong? Feel that you belong. And it was interesting, there was summing up uh, that we call this, this inclusivity paradox. Um, I think we all know that, you know, we make places, we want to make it for all, but it's actually for no one. So a lot of these people reported that places that they did feel that they belonged to were actually places that they felt ownership of, places that included them, but excluded others. So how do we make that work, right? Um, and it becomes so complex. And I think that for me, after 25 years, I was like, yes, we know something. We know how to build bike lanes. We know how to build cities that helps us change behavior when it comes to mobility and stuff and relaxing in that. But then this, how do we build a city that is inclusive for all? How do we build places that really makes people feel that they belong? How do we make sure that we build places where everyone feels empowered? How do we do that? Like, I felt I couldn't like, end without at least trying to think about what that type of future could look like. So I had this, you know, aha moment, and I'm going to try this on you guys, uh, what it was all about. So what the image I got was mono skiing. Let's see if we can get this. You remember mono skiing? Anyone did it? What I felt was mono skiing, mono, it's so outdated. Like we cannot in the future do anything that is so singular as mono. Like thinking of monofunctional, we can't do that. We have to go way beyond multifunctional situation. We can't do monologue. We have to do much more than dialogue, but we never do monologue. We can't do monotony, right? We have to be super clear on creating diversity in a variety of expressions. I don't know if monogamy is part of this stuff. I don't think so or hope so, I don't know. But so this is what we should not do. What I do think is a better analogy of how we could think in the future is Oh, can you go back? What? Start from the scratch. from scratch. You guys don't know it? Yes. yes. This is what we have to do. No. Yes. There we go. Ski ballet. But this is really, you know, here we have the combination of everything we need. It's like skiing, it's music, it's artistry, it's both being super technical and hard, but, but emotional. And it's everything baked into one action. And I think that, uh, can we start? We have to look at from the beginning. Yes. Kind of felt like... The early hot dog contests were a trial and error affair. Every Would you yes. look at those sleeves on his outfit? This is a guy. He is really one dramatic skier. And I'm just thinking if we're going to embark on this journey and not the monoski stuff, it's going to be awkward. And it's going to feel like really uncomfortable because, you know, can we really do this? Can we change our behavior in this sense? Um, but I think it's going to be fun. So that's what I wanted to give you as a lot. Prompt for the future. Thanks, Dick. I mean, how can I turn this off, you guys? I don't know. I feel like we, we've peaked early. All right. Thank you, Eva.